And we're live. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is uh, a conversation community send. Uh, this one is called Data, Storytelling, and Narratives. Uh, and with me today is David Amland of some semantic search fame, at least in Google Plus, but sort of increasingly <laughs> elsewhere. Uh, and he and I are going to sort of see if we can sort of look at data, storytelling, and narratives through a couple of particular lenses. Obviously, one of them is uh, semantic search, another is community management, and I mean digital community management, and a couple of other kind of um, additional lenses um, is technology, digital spaces as themselves, and actually I forgot the third one, was that? Ah, design and anticipatory design. Basically, what everyone wants right now. What everyone wants right now, both personal brands and, and large corporate brands, is kind of to more or less sort of try to sort of escape uh, content management, more or less, and or find out some new value proposition to do with saving time, or at least spending time wisely. Uh, so, I mean, without further ado, uh, first, thanks much for, 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 for joining, David. And let's see if we can sort of start you, start off here with what you see as possibly two or three most important patterns when it comes to the intersection of, let's call it social media for now, and semantic search. Um. <coughs> Thank you very much for asking me to be here. And there are, there are a number of things um, in order of importance, but the primary ones are certainly a sense of identity, which is um, now for the first time ever capable of being created and sustained. And identity in the past, historically, was always something which was ascribed to us and was to a large extent outside our control. So we could argue that to um, in, in a digital age, it's much greater more granular control in that respect than ever before. And with identity now, we also have intent and purpose, which also comes with it, um, brings with it a sense of trust and authority. And these are the, this is the package around which we coalesce as entities. Uh, it's the same struggle whether you're an individual or you're a brand. Whether you're one person or we are 38,000 people, whether you're in one geographic location or whether you're scattered across the globe, is immaterial because your digital presence coalesces around data points and data drives everything. And how that data is managed, presented, interconnected, and packaged together becomes a defining characteristic. Semantic search, in many ways, helps unearth all these. Communities or social networks is the sphere or the environment where many of the activities actually take place. Mm -hmm. There's a small danger here to think that um, we it's something which is easy to manage, perhaps easy to manufacture, certainly create. Therefore, it is something which can be projected and it can be false. The short answer to this is that yes, in the short term, this is certainly possible, but it is not likely to happen. It's not likely to happen because semantic search essentially uh, does a lot of data mining collecting relational points between um, different bits of data, which are basically bits of identity, which sustain the entire edifice you're trying to create. And if there's a false note there, it comes crashing down soon enough. Yeah. So paradoxically enough, in a world where we can practically construct our identity from scratch, we also manage to be more authentic to ourselves than ever before. It's one of those paradoxes. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you touched upon some, I think, uh, are uh, crucial viewpoints here. I mean, <clears throat> the in a bit of a, I mean, we are kind of living in internet time now. Everything is kind of obsolescing kind of rapidly, right? So talk, technology, which used to kind of be the general panacea for everything, is kind of not anymore. People want to begin to increasingly talk about unplugging and things like that. Uh, digital places, I mean, th there was time just a couple of years ago when sort of everyone was on Facebook and I'm talking with my kid even though they have Facebook accounts right and they are kind of managing their social graph they are not on Facebook anymore and also the third lens uh, design and anticipatory design I, I actually think you outlined that beautifully just now in those kind of couple of sentences uh, and 
the data sets and the data points and how they relate to both creating networks, creating graphs, and also creating meaningful connectivity. I mean, for the benefit of our readers, could you sort of see just so we could weave those a bit tighter together? Yes, absolutely. I mean, essentially everything which we do um, creates a digital presence, so a digital footprint, which leaves traces. And um, nothing which we do which stands in a silo or stands alone really has any kind of value because now the value lies in the relational exchange that takes place. So I could, for instance, have the most, or you could, the most brilliant idea ever. You sit there in a silo and have it on your own and that brilliant idea has absolutely zero impact. You may as well have never had it. But the moment that idea is actually shared and um, regurgitated, re reiterated and passed around, it acquires power. And what gives it power? Well, the, the connectivity factor, which essentially becomes an amplification factor. So essentially, what gives us power as individuals, what gives our identity and our brand equity, if we're going to use the corporate word for it, is the fact that we never stand alone anymore. Essentially, we're all connected, and that connectivity has an impact because each of us affects a great many other uh, number of individuals. So everything which we do is amplified. And it's that amplification, that connectivity, the fact that the traditional barriers have broken down, that basically we, we can connect with anybody at any time, almost anywhere, that have changed so many things. They've changed the way we access information, they've changed the way we think about the world, they've changed the way business is done traditionally, they changed the way even of how we think about companies and governments and institutions. Yeah, <clears throat> there's a, an interesting um, narrative sequence that I sort of banded back and forth between me and John Hegel. I mean, John Hegel's original version is access, attract, achieve. And although I like that, I sort of couldn't help myself sort of add to that a bit. So I sort of posited now the kind of access, attract, uh, amplify, augment, achieve. I mean, obviously, access and achieve is kind of you start with accessing networks or accessing information or accessing graphs or whatnot. So that kind of kind of is a almost a default default starting point. And for at least for pragmatic reasons, uh, even though that has been beginning to change as well. So we can sort of say, for simplicity's sake, that it ends in some kind of achievement, right? You get more people in your network, you get more followers, you get more out of return on engagement, out of engagement, or whatever you want to achieve. But I, w I would want to sort of, if you could sort of, uh, well, complexify or com complicate a bit uh, what it actually sort of, what you see already happens and what might happen in between. Well, um, I'm, I'm glad you said that everything has have a point and you need to achieve something. And certainly this is very true in a digital sphere. Unlike the physical world, we don't have a, we do have a choice. You don't have to be here. So the moment you are here, you actually have an intent, which behind it has a purpose. Mm -hmm. The purpose may be um, perhaps not as hard defined as some, some other people's. So everybody's at a different place there. But it certainly is there, which is why we're here. Now, there are a great many things to what a purpose might be. Uh, obviously, sometimes it is it works on a, on a sort of knowledge gain equation where you find out uh, specific things, you enables you to do things quicker at your job. But um, at other times, it can be um, as complicated as creating a reputation for yourself through your connections and the relational exchanges that you enter into. And, and by this, basically, it's 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 the activity as an individual which connects you to other people which releases the value of that connection we frequently say in this space that individuals and our brands we don't really quantify this but we are brands in exactly the same way that a brand actually stands for something which has value as individuals we never really had before to act in that way in the physical world you're defined perhaps by your job or you're defined by your family connections or by your family name and this is the ascribed identity but in a world where you construct your own identity you're also free or a lot freer than before to ascribe to yourself a new set of values or a new set of value if it's singular 
And in terms of that, um, your activity releases it. So what you bring to the table in terms of knowledge, in terms of interaction, in terms of enhancement, even in terms of amplification. Some people are very happy to simply be part of a group where they enhance and, and amplify the signal of that group's intent. Yeah, I mean, let, let's see if I can wrap my mind around this. I mean, so, so I mean, you're just going to fire out some things and be, I'm happy to sort of be corrected here. Uh, so instead of value and values maps, it's value and values mapping. Yes. Yeah. And instead of seeing one linear strategic path from access to uh, achieve, it's you could almost say that. I mean, we have lots of things here. We have sort of social graphs, which are kind of which were kind of born and, and grown in. in, in mostly in Facebook. I mean, they, they were kind of popularized there. In Google+, Plus, we have something different. that is a shared interest graph. Uh, in Inter, you have some, I mean, it's anyone's guess really what Twitter is. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it works perfectly for news and broadcast. Yes. Uh, so there's different networks, different graphs. But to simplify, you could say that online communities, networks, social graphs, uh, shared interest graphs, you could say that they are social technologies. And, yes. and to, sort of well, to help us uh, uh, to, in its simplest terms, graph traversal. I would say that they're part of an emerging culture of semantic technologies. Because essentially a social network is not simply an aggregation of a group of people. It is an aggregation of a group of people who are there through design and with intent. And that releases its own set of signals. They have a purpose, purposes in the plural. So basically, everything we see now as part of the progressing of technology is driven by semantics in the broader sense of the word, in that it is there to make sense of what we do and why we do it. Ah, so you, let's see. I, I, mean, I just have to be kind of very subjective here. And, and um, I really love the emerging culture of semantic technologies. I mean, this is kind of a beautiful encapsulation. So. Uh, to see if you can anchor this. Actually, this also means that words like authenticity, trust, uh, influence, uh, they need to be both sort of anchored in what was, but we also have to sort of constantly be open for how they actually are redefined and evolved in, in, in when we are, uh, when we the, are re the, creating and recreating our identities. Exactly. They're part of the, I mean, Identity is never fixed. If we take the psychological definition of identity, it's part of an evolving personal narrative where a lot of elements are constantly being synthesized there. The, the difference is that in the past, a lot of those elements were given to us and we've had to work with them. And now we're in a position to actually create our own or take in our own. So we create our own narrative, which gives us a lot more control gives us a lot higher intent. So basically what we've done in the digital sphere now, we've entered a, an entirely new higher level of, let's call it existence, of being. Because that higher level of control also allows us to clarify our purpose a lot better and allows us to understand our own intent. And also it allows us to clarify what is of real value to us. These things you know, we talk a lot about trust and authenticity precisely because this is what helps everything happen. Without a sense of authenticity, we're only playing games. Without a sense of trust, we can have no meaningful exchange of anything. And we all sense that meaning and meaningfulness is exactly what's happening. So our struggle to understand the mechanism of, of authenticity and also understand the mechanism of trust is exactly um, the reason, or rather it's happening, because we want to understand uh, the mechanics that drive everything and what is real and what isn't. So again, it's a sense of self-definition, which is part of our identity, and it's constantly evolving. Like the, the discussion we're having right now, you know, a year from now will happen along the same parameters with different content, and 10 years from now will be similarly, uh, the content will be, will have moved on, the parameters will have moved on. Yeah. I mean, is is the is the merit to I mean, uh, someone like uh, Robert Scoble, for instance, I mean, and and obviously for marketing person purpose also, but there's a there's a true core, uh, honest, authentic purpose as well. I mean, in his recent 
book, I think it's called Context, right? Uh, is the, uh, and this, by the, by the way, is not meaning to dissing Robert Scholl at all, because I, I do happen to believe that context, and at least, and even more so, um, shared, shareable context is, is, is crucial, both for ourselves and how we develop identities, but also for, you could call it community, or you could call it culture, you could call it shared interest, uh, affinity networks, uh, brands, uh, corporate brands, companies, I mean all those are uh, cultural artifacts that, that, we, that we need to make sense, that we need to navigate. Uh, and so, I mean, in a way, I kind of like the idea of, yeah, he, he lets you sort of elect context as king and queen and the whole sort of uh, court, right? And then we can sort of work from there. I, mean, I, think, uh, I would like your take. Well, context really is a parameter. That's all it is. Um, but it's a very important parameter because it allows us to unleash value. Because at the end of the day, everything we do, absolutely everything, whether it's online or offline, can be devolved or deconstructed down to a data level. Data, when it's amplified and multiplied to that, to that kind of magnitude, becomes just so much noise. And the only time that that noise actually becomes a signal is when you apply context at the point where it has value to you personally. Again, in the past, we never had that. The more things we had access to, the, le the less capable we became because you know, we had things like information overload and information paralysis and um, decision paralysis simply because we had too many choices. And the only way out of this is to contextualize it because we have the perception of many choices. For instance, you know, when you go into your local store and you can look at mayonnaise, you can see 52 different brands. And you say, well, I can't choose 52 different brands. But if you say to yourself, you know, I only happen to like spicy foods. Well, then there's only probably five different brands of mayonnaise that you can choose from. The other 52 become irrelevant. And that's how context helps us deal with the increasing load of data which surrounds us. And I must say, the amount of data which we live in right now is nothing compared to what is actually going to happen a year from now, two years from now. So context is really important. Yeah. I mean, th this is a bit of a leap, but what you're saying is, uh, I mean, we haven't sort of touched on search, and so I would love if we could sort of hopefully sort of seg into that. And <laughs> let's see if I can sort of make that via decision quality. You could say, and every time we search, I mean, even kind of in the most concrete, pragmatic sense, we've kind of put some search parameters into a Google search window and just press search, right? Uh, or I mean, we could sort of press the button, I feel lucky, or, or kind of, I mean, any which kind we, but my idea here is that even all those moments, micro moments, micro decisions, leading up to whatever words we want to sort of put in the search, field in the, uh, to, to begin with, right? Those are also part of both search and semantic search. Absolutely. And let's touch on search, because what is search? Search as we knew it up to the year 2010 was a very crude way of actually accessing data. And even at its finest back then, Google was still a very crude kind of um, tool in order um, in trying to mine the data across the web um, and give us what we needed. And the, the level of crudeness is evident by the level of dissatisfaction surrounding search in those days. We're four years on now and we have had almost um, two years of semantic search. And we can actually see a constant refinement of the signals which we access. As data multiplies around us, we're not conscious of the masses of data that is being generated. What we are conscious of, what we are aware of, is the fact that we can go into search and get an answer that we actually need. And it's that kind of convenience which we're going to see accelerate because right now, semantic search, it's still in its infancy. It will get better and better and better until it becomes almost predictive in many ways. And really, the best kind of search is one which you don't have to actually make. So having the ability to have predictive search at your fingertips or when you open up your device, there are all the things which you're probably looking for, plus things which you might be interested in, plus you know, things which you may want to action. To have your own personalized search agent where you can say, you know, get me all the data, um, all the research papers on 
something specific. And it goes away and actually gets it for you. Now to have that kind of power, that's where we're actually heading towards. So in, in the evolution search, we've only taken the first step out of quite a few. Uh, th this is, um, I mean, this helps access. This helps uh, attract essential da data points around our story. Uh, this both enables and and amplifies uh, the sharing of the story. I mean, both the kind of the, the, the act of sharing out and the sort of act of listening to stories. Um, but let's see if we can sort of do some, because this is, I think, very, very important in terms of what I sort of promised in the beginning, kind of the anticipatory design. Can you, uh, could, is it possible to d describe, possibly not now, because as you said, it's infancy, I would agree. I mean, I'm kind of checking, monitoring closely, and, and sometimes, I mean, I, they're getting better, right? The, the automated <laughs> suggestions on my Google Plus post, the, the, the automated hashtags. But sometimes they're still off, right? But yes. I, this is something that is, uh, I mean, let, let's say two it years from now, when, when they are becoming really, really good. So I'm almost kind of having them as kind of an exo brain and relying on, yeah, th th those are fine, right? And this is kind of where it begins to sort of be an, 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 an intelligence augmentation almost. Yes, and that's yeah. that's the that's the power of search. Essentially, it has to amplify our own capabilities. It shouldn't be there to do the things we tell it to do. It should actually help us do more of the things we want to do. And and that's where it's heading. In order to do that, it needs to understand us better. So basically, if we look at the semantic technologies, they're always uh, made up of three layers, like a sandwich almost. Uh, the outer layer is the um, programming. The middle layer is always the interface, which is always going to be evolving, and the other outer layer is us. And you need all those three things to come together in order to get contextual value. Now, if you have any of those three missing, that's it. It doesn't work. So it's a very delicate balance. It's like a tripod. Three, three legs work perfectly well when it's a dynamic element between them. The moment you take one away, it just collapses. And a lot of the things which we see right now in terms of how where it's, it's heading and where it's going um, are going to, to, to improve because we've seen the first things with Google Now, for instance, we get pretty accurate predictions of what we need in a very narrow context. And you mentioned that you see improvement and then you see a slide back. And the reasons for that is that the data set is always growing. So it's very easy to apply a set of rules or dynamics in a limited data set and get really good at it. But as the data multiplies and broadens and widens, then you get a slip in quality because you introduce higher uncertainty factors. Yeah. So then you have to iterate and get it better. And the moment it gets better, then you broaden the data set again <laughs> and slips again. At some point, obviously, however, it'll get better and better and better because even with infinite data, there's only so many permutations that you can actually have. So yeah. really, it's yeah. it's learning the permutations. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the uh, I try to sort of imagine this as if there's five, six hundred million people, give or take a couple of million, right, listening in as kind of a very neutral, very sort of non-committal, but yet participatory agency. And, and, and when I do that, the funniest thing happened, I mean, this could just sort of be imagining things, right? And I mean, I've drank the Kool-Aid and I've sort of done a couple of thousand Google Plus posts. But I don't think it's only that, that you suddenly realize that it actually does matter quite a lot what you yes. put in. Exactly. And also what I'm realizing now, and I mean, this is kind of me, uh, kind of give a full confession inside even this interview that I have been sort of known to have the brain the size of a small planet. and I have quite until recently have been difficult have been have some difficulties suffering fools now from my upbringing and since I've studied sense making and narratives in God knows what right but what I'm realizing now is that people who are sharing cat gifts I mean th th there's an Alexandra Ricky Gonzalez I think her name is brilliant communicator she mm -hmm. sort of summed those up in sort of cat, cats and bacon yes. And and but what I'm realizing is that they are equal partners in sort of co-creating this uh, computational sense making, this increasing 
exactly. uh, accuracy and agency in augmentation. We used to be, and I'm very, I'm very glad you brought up um, the way perhaps we operated in the past, where within our very own limited parameters, <clears throat> we were very comfortable interacting at almost any level. But the moment we stepped outside them, we had a very rigorous set of rules that others had to abide by, or we would reject them. Yeah. That was the value proposition we applied for our interactions with others. And looking back, we can see how wrong it was. The moment you open up connectivity, the value proposition of interaction changes entirely. So the moment you have cut gifts, which you think, you know, what is the purpose of that? It's waste my time, waste computer time, and it gives me no knowledge whatsoever. At the same time, it creates a certain common framework of interaction and engagement, which is in itself catalytic towards other things. So although I don't know you, and this leads back to trust and authority and authenticity, although I don't know you, it is very difficult for me in the beginning to actually talk to you about anything meaningful because I don't know who you are. I don't know what your knowledge is. I don't know what your intent and purpose is. I don't know if you have an agenda. So I will tell you absolutely zero about semantic search even though you may ask me a direct question. It depends if I'll answer. Yeah. But if we have interacted over the innocuous sharing of a couple of cut gifts, that gives me a sense that at least to a certain degree, you have a, say, a shared commonality of values as I have to some degree. And that allows me to take the next step and trust you a little bit and give you the kind of open answer which you wouldn't otherwise get. So basically the sharing of meaninglessness in our conversations is on the web in terms of cut gifts and stupid jokes and sometimes quotes which mean absolutely nothing except sound good it becomes the shared culture that we create in the offline world when we get three people in a room they know they have to talk business but they start off by saying isn't it a great day we're having great weather or it's raining again totally yeah. meaningless conversation but it allows us to establish a certain um, bedrock upon which everything else can rest. Yeah. So that is the value of this kind of engagement interaction. And that is why now we know that we can't really reject anybody simply because they don't abide by our own sense of narrow criteria of meaningfulness because they're in the process of establishing that kind of connection. Yeah. And this was almost an instant trust. I mean, let, let me see if I can sort of give a concrete example. There was a kind of, just earlier today, there was a, a post, I think it was started by Leland Le Couillet, uh, and he just flings out uh, a question, why did the chicken cross the road? Yes. I mean, I obviously, like, that's, I that's that. just sort of great, great fun, right? Uh, <laughs> And but everybody joined in, people who have you know, tremendous yeah. status in terms of knowledge and experience and business acumen, they joined in with some sort of silly remark. Yeah. It, it allows us to establish a kind of connection because, I mean, you know, for instance, if we take, I mean, Gideon Rosenblatt, who's incredibly focused and talks about the very, uh, very serious subject of social business and the transition of legacy business models to social business one. Uh, he chipped in there and you know he, yeah. he sort of says something funny. The thing is, if you don't know Gideon, suddenly, because he was funny and there's a lot of levity in the stream, you attempted to go out and find out who he is. And the subjects he shares are incredibly important. And that's how you actually create a kind of serendipitous almost connection. Yeah. Yeah, and also the the uh, the the speed with which the uh, the topic evolved. I mean, uh, I remember correctly now who said what. I think it was Mark Trapping who said then rift from chickens all the way to Casablanca and said we will always have G plus. And oh, yes. <laughs> this is obviously for kind of a newbie just onlookers. These guys are just weird. Right? I mean, they, they are overworked. They are worked hard, and obviously there's a bit of that, right? Because we're kind of 24/7 always on. <laughs> but there's an other deeper dimension here. Instant trust, instant rapport, instant ambience. Yes, exactly. And this is where, obviously, you could almost, I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, but you could always say, almost say, that if you would give more of an empowerment, even for a big brands, ambassadors, uh, evangelists, uh, also employees and stakeholders, if they would realize that we are basically just one click away and they could basically engage us by riffing on anything, right? Hmm. That's, the, that's a struggle they face because as we become very adept 
at acting like a brand in terms of um, putting together and synthesizing all the elements that create our identity and produce a unique value proposition, brands which have always done this are faced with the challenge of becoming personal and actually putting a human face to their communication. And it's a lot harder for them to do that. Although, you know, we for us we have, you know, it is relatively easy or a lot easier to um, adopt brand like behavior and simply put it in as a, an, an extra layer on our activities for them to actually become human, uh, talk to us at that level becomes a lot more difficult because they're simply not geared up for it. And this is the disruptive power of what we're doing right now. In order for a brand to actually do that, it has to change internally because the current culture of spreadsheets and pie charts and reports and processes and command and control structures, which it has traditionally uh, had in place, is not really conducive to a brand working this way. So in order to do that, it needs to change internally. In order to change internally, it needs to create better communication internally, uh, break down the barriers in between different silos in its organization, and create a lot more trust. So basically, we're asking for the brand or the business of today to mirror the network effect it sees outside in order to connect with us. And in doing so, it completely disrupts itself. So it changes completely. It changes the identity you has had for the last 150 years. There are, there, are, there are brands already, I mean, quite a few, not, not that many, right? Because, I mean, it hasn't pivoted yet. But let's say Valve, uh, Sappos, uh, with, with your experience of working with big brands, do you see some better, easier kind of onboarding uh, affordances or uh, transitions or, or entry well, points? They're, they're all aware that they need to change. And they are aware that they need to change because when they look at the current figures which they have in front of them, they can see that what they have been doing traditionally has been giving them ever decreasing returns year on year. And they're not doing anything differently. So they understand that the target market or the audience or the marketplace has changed. In order for them then to address this, they need to change internally. The thing is, if you have any kind of legacy business model in place, if you change too quickly, you're going to die because it's so disruptive, you're going to lose the entire ability to connect with your audience and you won't be able to survive that kind of shock. So it has to be an incremental change because you know they're, they're still working, they're still operating, they're still trying to get our business, they're still trying to connect with us. The businesses which I work with are challenged because they work across different cultures, different languages, different language barriers, different um, local setup in terms of where they are, in terms of social media, and they still have as a brand to apply a kind of um, a sort of a one single voice or one single approach to all this and provide consistency. And that's not easy. So they're struggling internally to do that. The, the good thing is that they're actually doing it. And for the last two years, I have seen incremental changes, incremental steps in, or in, in their ability to actually um, perform better. We mustn't forget that most businesses today are led by CEOs who live in the past. So all of the brands I advise have changed, the CEOs haven't, and their mindset is still stuck in the 20th, 20th century, we're left behind. Yeah. So it's going to take a lot more time and a lot more steps. But the good news is it's happening, it's inevitable. And those brands which don't change are going to be obsolete and die, or they're going to be the last holdouts, and they'll only hold out as long as their uh, target market allows them a kind of virtual monopoly. And I'm talking here about um, the banking system is one element, and the banking system is actually changing. And certainly the petroleum industry, because there's a virtual monopoly in the way they're set up, because the entry cost is so high, well, you know, they <laughs> don't have to be active in social media. <laughs> yeah, I mean, banking is interesting because uh, that might also be one of the pivots, right? Because, I mean, banking and obviously almost everyone would know that banking is very conservative and almost they have to be conservative, right? They're kind of dealing with someone else's, I mean, our money, right? So, so if, if they would be frivolous, they would be out of business. business. But well, I would say perhaps yeah. a little bit of that conservatism would, wouldn't have hurt when they were messing around with the LIBOR rate. Well, they were getting into the London whale crisis where they frittered away hundreds of millions of 
money on a on a certainly what is a bet. Yeah. So they have had a double standard. They're very conservative at one edge and they're not at all conservative at the other. And the reason they have had a double standard is simply because they had been trusted to police themselves. There's been no, no real oversight, no real transparency, no real ability to actually curb what they're doing. And they said, you know, we are the experts, we'll do it. We have seen it doesn't work. Again, it's a gradual transition. We see the banking system changing. It will change even more. But because it's a working banking system on a global scale, we can't disrupt it to the extent that we go back to the Stone Age. That's not going to work. So it has to be small incremental steps all the way. Yeah. But also, I mean, one of the hopeful signs that I'm kind of already beginning to see that since they all are on board, even inside the banking industry, their main business is trust. They are obviously at least clever enough to realize that very quickly the networks and the social networks and even more so the shared interest graphs are quickly growing into being arbiters of trust. Yes, they, they can see, they've seen that. Yeah. Um, they also know that they need to re-earn the trust we had in them once because that has seriously been eroded. It's going to be a slow process because when you lose trust in an institution, I mean, trust by definition is hard to gain and easy to lose. This is the entire value proposition about it. You have to work very hard to gain relatively a small amount of trust. It takes one wrong move, one mistake, maybe two, and you've lost pretty much all of it and you have to work really hard to gain it again. So that's where they are at the moment and the only way they can get a trust back is going through the transition of change that we see right now and obviously, naturally, they're resisting it because we, they are institutions which have been set up to resist change as every institution and every organization and it's going to take a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, this is a bit of a leap back from, from back. You just kind of use the personal reflection to sort of see, kind of to, to at least empathize a bit with the kind of the resistance, the homeostasis, right? I mean, you give me kind of a personal example. I have as of now 20,000 people in my Google Plus circles, which is kind of way too much, too many people. I don't know what to do with half of them, right? So, I mean, what do I do? Well, I talk kind of a select few of them away in a community, which are now 780 people. Uh, still way too many, right? Uh, so I did a kind of a, an experiment the other day. So I wanted to select 40 or 50 of them. And I wanted just to make as good use of my own personal judgment and have that play as well and be informed and augmented by the actual Google Plus relevance uh, algorithm. As it is kind of shown, people higher up in, in my circles are kind of more relevant as judged by, by Google Plus. Uh, now, the interesting thing here is I realized kind of halfway through, I mean, this is an impossible exercise. How do you sort of cut away 28,000 people and are left with 40, right? It's impossible. Uh, but since I already did and it's already published and I sort of was taking the vulnerability and trust plunge to actually put it out there and kind of suffering the consequences, I realized it was a trust exercise. Hmm. And yes. this is kind of where um, trusting not only, I mean, I need to just somewhat my judgment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I need to sort of do whatever heuristics rules of the thumb I have, judging on whatever combinations of, of, of um, personal experience from people who have sort of been long time engagers, uh, people who have sort of proven themselves again and again and again that they have some meaningful to say, that they treat others well, and I mean there's lots and lots of, lots of things, right? But then, at, at the last sort of thing, when I thought that there's 10 more people that need to go. So, I mean, the, the 40, 40, 50 that was kind of left wasn't the hardest. The hardest decisions I ever had to make was those runners-up hmm. that I would have really loved to also include. But I had already kind of set, because then it was kind of turn can kind of useful experience for us, because if I had 10, was to say I wouldn't sort of add, need to add 10 more. I mean, at any which point, there are people who are going to bound to be disappointed, right? Yes, wherever you draw the line. I mean, this is the yeah. this is the perennial ground of um, politics when uh, legislation comes into play, or um, any kind of decision-making process in a game. Uh, wherever you draw the line, 
some people are going to fall on one side of it, some people are going to fall on the other. And there's no perfect criteria you can actually apply. Uh, ideally, you'd like to be all-inclusive. Sometimes that becomes um, not as possible as it should be. So really, the ultimate criteria is the value you deliver, um, not just at a personal level or very contextual level, but also for the group itself. If, for instance, you take away a small group of people and you do something which releases value for the broader community, which is then accessible to everybody, I think that kind of justifies a lot of the choices you make. Yeah. If you make it particularly close to a particular group, that's you know that's a, that becomes a bit more questionable because you're doing something which not everybody can see or even understand, and then when you have your own word to take as to how valuable that is, we can't access it. Yeah. And that tends to raise all sorts of questions. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what you're saying is important also because in terms of anticipatory design and also to give a concrete example of that, we are actually doing a Google Plus Hangout on Air right now. It's recorded and it's going to be sort of automatically transported into YouTube and then you and I can basically sort of go and um, develop further products based on this or spin further or kind of add annotations, transcripts, Google Plus posts, whatever, right? B basically develop knowledge products. So this means that even though you and I, I mean, you kind of as for, for, for the benefit of, of the readers, me, me and David has been talking on and off on this Google Plus platform for almost kind of two years now. So kind of, I mean, you almost feel like a friend, right? Which is a bit weird because we haven't actually met other than through these hangouts. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that you're weird, but you just kind of I know what you, I know what you mean. Digitally enhanced, right? <laughs> yes. But this means that we are increasingly aware that we need to sort of both be authentic. Basically, just yes. we're just having a conversation, right? Yes. But also, we need to also have in the back of our minds there might be one or two or others, um, possibly more if we're doing our job right, uh, to actually want to view and, and listen and, and derive some kind of value out of this, right? So there's, mm -hmm. there's an audience, basically. And this is mean, I mean, this for me means that we almost have to begin to think more and more about both design, design synthesis, but also anticipatory design. What yes. will happen with this? Uh, well, not only this hangout on air, but if we would do a series of 10 or 15 hangouts, right, what will happen with them repackaged in one year from now? Well, that's anticipatory design in many ways takes into account semantic thinking. And semantic thinking in a broad context means that if you have three things and you put them together, depending on how you actually put them together, the grouping of the in a straight, let's say the three marbles. Do you form a triangle? Do you put them in a straight line? Do you try and balance them one on top of the other? Do you just throw them random across the room? Whatever you decide, those three marbles in their grouping send a separate and different signal. So there's an interpretation element stroke layer that is applied to that. Anticipate your design does pretty much that. And in many ways, what we're doing right now where we're discussing things in a very open, friendly, and, and perhaps we could say even vulnerable way because we're sharing ideas without uh, being too guarded about them. Well, it happened before. It happened in the coffee shops of London and it led to the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's the value of um, cognitive surplus, essentially, just being shared. Uh, we're the difference is, and when I, say, I suppose in the coffee shops in London, they were all also aware of it, is that we are very much aware of the effect this has. So yes, it's me and you yeah. talking, but we know we're being overheard. We know that others will take that conversation and they will interpret it, expound it, build upon it, and do new things. Some of those things will be fantastic. They'll go to a, you know. A, a level which you and I can't even imagine. And that's how things iterate. This is the exciting factor. This is what we actually feel on a global basis now. Um, there are only two instances in history where we had this before. Um, we had it with the Industrial Revolution in London, and before that we had it in Germany when uh, Martin Luther put yeah. his uh, 95 yeah. Thesis on the church wall, and it led to the Reformation, which changed much of the world, known world of the time we can see and sense the disruptive power of idea sharing. We can see and sense the disruptive power of this kind of connection, which allows us to understand um, and redefine the sense of value that the world usually imposes upon us. So uh, 
all this is, is tremendously empowering. And at the same time, given the fact we have so much power, like Spider-Man, it gives us a sense of responsibility. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to sort of to put the, 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 the black Spider-Man suit on too soon, at least, right? <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, there's a thing here that you said that sort of touched some something in me, right? There's this um, kind of sense of a, of, a, of a quickening, almost, that, that there's... Uh, I mean, you and I have experienced when we talked before, that it's almost, I mean, at least from my point, it's almost as if I'm sort of growing kind of a bit more clever from actually just talking with you, right? And we have sort of experienced moments of serendipity. I mean, some things that are would outside of the web would almost seem seem weird, right? But we well, have sort of the, the, the beginning data sets and the beginning shared understanding yeah. track to let's, see that let's, it's let's actually not that weird. It's just an, at a kind of a different level. Almost. Let's talk about cleverness and power. And let's talk about somebody like the, United, the President of the United States. And you think, you have the President of the United States, and arguably, he's the most intelligent, most powerful man in the world. And he's not really, he's just a guy who plays basketball twice a week, right? And runs a country. But yes, he's knowledgeable, and he's powerful. And what makes him so is the number of people who are invested in his role. So he has one, two, three national security agencies, stroke type of agencies which supply him with information and he has tens of thousands of people ready to do his bidding. They're the amplification points of the role. So if you step into the role, suddenly you become the most powerful stroke intelligent person in the world. The point of this is that in a network effect, we all have almost the same kind of power. Obviously, perhaps you and I haven't got an army at our command, but we <laughs> definitely have a lot of as many brains as we can borrow. Yeah. So if you're feeling more intelligent, well, this is the result of that. And the same here. I feel a lot more intelligent. Without my internet connection, without G+, I feel completely stupid. I feel like I've been lobotomized. I can't access half the stuff I want. I can't talk to anybody. You feel very isolated. Inside our heads, we only become stupid. We don't learn anything and we forget half the things we know. The moment we step outside our heads, and we actually connect with other people's thoughts, other people's brains, then inevitably we become smarter, we become more proactive. So the quickening we feel is that connection which makes us smarter. Suddenly we feel a sense of power which we didn't have before. Cognitive power, knowledge, access, opportunity. Again, these are disruptive forces in our world. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, you touched upon in investment. I mean, let's see if we can sort of go all the way back to if any would be large brands, businesses, companies would sort of listen to this and they, they would sort of bring up the sort of the dreaded sword kind of, oh, so what's the business line? So let's kind of see if we can sort of rope this all the way back and down to there. I mean, in, in, in its simplest terms, at least for me, uh, a good effective outcome, which is what a kind of a business model and some business logic should, should do, right? Uh, it's about investment, and it's about quality, and it's about uh, uh, decisions, and preferably all three, right? Uh, so th th this is kind of something I would love to sort of see. You could sort of look at from a... Let's just stay with sort of the, the um, power and intelligence and connectivity. Things. Let's look at that from a, com a commercial point of view. Yeah. Let's say yeah. we have a company which sells tennis balls, for instance. And that's what it does. It makes the best tennis balls in the world. They're expensive, but they're really, really good. There are two paths to here that it, it can actually follow. One is it can invest heavily in advertising, bludgeon us with YouTube videos and television commercials telling us these are the best tennis balls in the world. Well, they're bound to say that, right? Because they make them. So instantly we think, yeah, so what? And who says that? And also, the more they say it, the less we're likely to believe it because they're investing so much effort into their shouting. But suppose instead of doing all that, they actually invest in giving away half a million tennis balls across the world to people who use, actually play tennis. And the tennis balls are so cool, those who play tennis, you know, they tweet about it, they write blog posts about it, they tell their friends about it, they say, you know, these are fantastic tennis balls. We'll get to hear about this. We'll get to hear about these fantastic tennis balls. We'll get to hear that this company does really good product without them t telling us anything about it. So basically, this is the way that you connect with your audience in a very real way. And there's a trust factor involved. When they tell us 
trust us to make that decision ourselves. They need to tell us and control the message. If they give us the product and say, do whatever you like with it, it's really cool. Then they trust us to understand that this is an exceptional product produced by exceptional, exceptionally clever people. And this is a company we should actually be promoting. Yeah. And if they isn't also... This actually, isn't this actually also a thing that you and I touched upon with, uh, was it Team Reiner? And we talked about uh, tribal dynamics. This yes. can actually be a working dynamic even for brands who want to transition towards from institutions hmm. to networks, right? Hmm. Because once they understand that they can treat, I mean, learn how to play well with the network, right? I mean, giving away tennis balls. Yeah. Uh, or giving away any which other kind of kind of other than premium services they have, right? Mm. Uh, then they quickly sort of establish presence that sort yes. of builds trust, meaningful connectivity, and instead of trying to sort of be smart about identifying you and me and others and just treat us particularly well because we might be key influencers, instead they can sort of begin to treat the network well, and then. Influences like you and me. I mean, our brands sort of depends on us being uh, quick on the draw in some respects. You with Semantic Search, me with my conversation community, or, or um, Gideon Rosenblatt with Good Business and so on. Right. So we are. It's in our own interest to find out very quickly and be on the edge of these things, and then we can uh, coalesce as influencers around whichever network effect happens out of there probing, sort of disturbing the force and sort of for, for a good thing, right? Because, I mean, it is good again, tennis balls, they, 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 they will kind of lead to a better client-customer experience and, and so on. So that, that's, I mean, that, that's also actually the bottom line. That, that's actually good stuff. They are, they are peddling, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, they have to have trust in what they're doing. Um, and, and, and this is exactly the difficulty that a lot of companies, traditional companies, have. They fail to trust their public. They need to tell them how, why they should purchase something instead of agreeing that, hey, this is really cool and we put our heart and soul into it. And, you know, that makes us almost partners because we put our, we invest ourselves into what we're doing and you invest yourselves in terms of the money you give us in order to do this and it satisfies both of us. This kind of co-creative approach is new as a concept. A lot of businesses are still in a push-pull kind of dynamic between their clients and themselves, and I see this on a daily basis almost. A lot of large businesses, corporate businesses, are still governed by the trenches, warfare, war mentality, which places us and them, and you know us on this side of the trench and everybody else on the other side, and they're potentially the enemy. It's all wrong. I know why it's been there, certainly over the last 150 years, as things scaled up and we created efficiencies of scale, it worked, but it also created the necessity of glitz and pomp and circumstance instead of real trust, because what we actually use as a criteria, whether we should trust a company or not, was the amount of money it invested in its advertising and in the size of its headquarters and the uh, ubiquity of its logo. Yeah. We don't need that anymore. We've evolved. And companies need to evolve with that. And those who don't get it, they will fail. And they will fail spectacularly. Yeah. I mean, if, if I would be a large business right now, I would probably be very, very curious about could John and David say something really, really clever about what is this sort of 21st century approach towards scaling a business. I mean, I mean, I can actually pose as a kind of a preliminary question to you. Should, should John and David sort of keep quiet on this and sell this as a premium service, right? I mean, what, what, is, the kind of, what is the kind of moment of truth in terms of kind of <laughs> think, uh, switching from comes, one to another, right? Uh, I think when it comes to keeping anything secret or premium these days, there's a, a natural resistance, certainly from my part on a personal level. But there's one which we feel throughout the network. If we haven't sampled the tennis balls, we're unlikely to go out and buy a six pack of them. So we need, need that first one they invested in and gave us to say, hey, this is really cool. And I'll give you an example. I, I spend um, a, fair, a fair amount of time each year traveling in the continent, usually Spain and Greece and Italy. And these are countries with a cultural history of street markets, which I absolutely love. Because as you go through a street market, you are inside a paradox. You're meeting people 
who have to sell something and have to sell it under a really tight imperative because it's fresh produce and it's not going to keep. So they really need to sell it. It is highly unlikely that they know you already. So to them, you're a brand new customer, potential customer. You may never see them again. And yet, they have to impress you with the quality of their product, give you a sense of service and connect with you, and they need to gain your trust really quickly. The best I've seen operate like this, apply a very simple, uh, very simple model. They make eye contact, they say something clever, which immediately catches your attention, and they give you the sample, some of their produce, and it's not something which is already pre-cut or anything, they will just, you know, if it's watermelons, for example, in the watermelon season, I've been in Italy where somebody just reached out for one from a pack, cut it with a open very dexterously, and gave me a slice to try, and it was really sweet. And you think, whoa, that's huge trust in their product. It's also huge trust in you, because you don't have to buy it. You sampled it, they can say thank you very much and walk away. Yeah, yeah. But if they've done their job right, you're actually going to buy. And I think there's an art to it. You know, the survival, the very survival depends upon it. And those who actually are good at their trade, they've got it down to a fine art. They, you know, connect with the customer without being over-friendly or too aloof. They convince you through their action and they complete a transaction. And, and you would say that if you sort of simplify, if we sort of then help us, I mean, we, we need sort of to, to go through the transition ourselves, right? To sort of to be more and more comfortable with us, even us as people and us as digital avatars. I mean, the, the putting the profile in whatever kind of Facebook, Google Plus, Twitter we have. Uh, and once we've done that, we need to sort of begin to sort of spread um, trust and meaningful connectivity to others. But once we've done that, could it be that the moment that even larger brands rediscovers this. So the way to scale is to look at what augments trust in a digital environment and how can a brand uh, incrementally grow meaningful connectivity both internally and externally. Well the way to scale this is, so, is to be so good that you actually have you actually create an evangelist out of every customer you have. And to take this back to the context of the street market I go to, street markets I go to, um, those who are really good at it, they are so good at everything, not just the way that they caught my attention and inspired my trust, but also their partnering mark and the way they make me feel. And I'm also more likely than to tell my friends about them. And also I found that if I stay in a city for longer than a couple of weeks, then the street market is on every week usually, I'll go back the next week and actually go to the same guy without looking for anybody else. And if you consider the context in which this takes place, it's quite amazing because they managed to win me out of you know a market which is relatively faceless, where everything is crammed side by side, uh, each one stall next to the other, and a lot of them are doing the very same thing. You know, you can get watermelon salesmen, for example, salespeople, for example, right next to each other or opposite each other within like three meters. So to manage to to get your custom and your loyalty, that's a huge achievement. And they yeah. do that through that, that personalized, value-driven connection. So there's a lesson there for companies. Uh, in many ways, the business lessons we're learning right now, they're not new. They've been there for forever. We just forgot them because we yeah. scaled fast and we became impersonal. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of relates to kind of a, a, a kind of a rule of thumb I usually done when I sort of been traveling as a consultant and go to kind of a completely different city in a completely different country. I usually try to, if I can go there one day before, I try to talk with someone in the local market, if there is one, and also try to talk with one or couple of, of, of taxi drivers. And once mm. I've done that, I basically have got the, 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 the tabs the of the land. on kind yes. of what, what goes on in the, that city, right? Exactly. And yes, it's obviously really, really helpful because then I sort of get kind of fresh, rich uh, context. Mm. So, so, I mean, the, the, um, but for, I mean, let's, let's see if you can sort of, I mean, I'm not good at it, but let's, let's see if you can play devil's advocate, right? If, if, let's pretend I'm a big brand, big corporate brand. 
Okay. Uh, I have a current responsibility of 100,000 people, and there's Byzantine feuds and turf wars and, and email wars and whatnot going on, kind of constantly, right? Yes. Uh, and there's three people who want sort of to, to, to stab me in the back and get my job as CEO, and, and kind of some pressures, right? Yes. Uh, so, uh, what would be uh, kind of a first beginning steps of a sort of a strategic path? Well, the first, it's the first, the very first step is the realization that this is a survival matter. I mean, you have all those internal dynamics, and internal politics, when everybody feels that you know things are going okay, regardless of what we do. So therefore, our primary focus is on our own careers and our own activities within the organization. The moment an organization realizes that it's actually struggling for its very survival, all those things go by the by because suddenly you're team players and you're going to do whatever to survive. So that's the first realization, and it, it takes a lot for a large corporation to actually realize that if it doesn't change, no matter how good things are right now, in 10 years, 15, 20, it'll be history. So basically, that's the first thing. And the moment that happens, then a lot of other things happen in a, in a much easier way, because um, the, the, the key thing is communication lines are put in place, and ideas come in and the receptivity of those ideas is a lot better than it would otherwise have been and the willingness is there to try things in a different way and that's the that's basically the um, point at which an organization begins to evolve actually we almost come full circle so this might be kind of a good way to sort of to, to, to kind of round up uh, because we started with identity right Yes. And on a kind of very abstract level. I mean, but now it's identity as in the information knowledge market jungle almost, right? So we kind yes. of almost kind of anchor the whole idea through. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, that's right. You have yeah. to ask an organization what it does it stand for? What is it? Yeah. What is its identity? Seven out of ten won't be able to tell you because, you know, business is business. It's very messy. It's very diffuse and it's easy to forget. And certainly yeah. corporate memory is very short. Yeah. So, the moment they start defining themselves, then they begin to realize their own inherent value. And that's critical. Because Actually, th this, is, this is a supporting point which we might be able to cram in as well. Uh, because you said when organizational memory, with the increasing access to big data, with, with kind of a, a increasingly lower cost than kind of doing it, and I mean Google are almost sort of giving away uh, space for free. Um, could it be, I mean, we, we won't have time for kind of all big data and how it's, it's, it's going to sort no, of no, but we said and, and, and steal our spirit and all that. But I mean, there's a kind of an, an additional thing that might be here, that if big, big, big data helps us as people and as big brands to augment our memories and the corporate memory, right? this might actually help them to at least indirectly through their own data rediscover who they actually are. Hmm. Well, in a way... Um, It'll help them define who they are rather than rediscover. And certainly the role of big data for any kind of organization is in lies in putting in place internally the same kind of network effect that you have outside. Data works outside an organization because it flows. It doesn't stop anywhere. Or if, if it meets an obstacle, it goes around it. Within an organization, you still have silos. Data comes in and it stays there. And the moment it stays there, its value dissipates. So essentially, networked organizations are the ones which will be the most robust, the most evolutionary, the most innovative, and the ones who will actually move into the middle and the end of the 21st century. Yeah. I mean, so before this, what you said, the essential realization that who we are as, as, as a big brand, right? Before that happens, that they actually have to change. This is kind of a, not a nice add-on with the network. It's a must-have, right? So yes. before that happens, then big data might be kind of a gilded cage. I mean, it will reinforce and validate kind of the erroneous assumption of identity or the well, search for it. No organization can make good use of big data if it doesn't change itself in a way that it actually um, shares information within its walls. Because um, in order to get big data, analyze it and contextualize it, you have to have quite a significant investment. And 
if you do that and don't change internally, all you're doing is just delaying the inevitable and making tiny gains instead of big leaps. So those organizations which at the moment are doubling with big data, and they're a lot, um, they are taking the first steps towards internal change themselves. And what happens is, you know, these things go together. They get big data, they see that it has to go through everywhere. They begin to change, you know, uh, network a few departments, which is a few more departments than the network globally. And then they realize that, you know, they need 24 seven access and then they need to have um, a sort of less hierarchy because they get good ideas from the most unlikely places. And suddenly you have a disruption within the organization almost before you know it. And, and that's a good thing. So. This is, a, this is the process and you know the whole talk about big data right now it's a challenge to implement in the first place so it's quite critical yeah 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 so we're seeing now the first wave of saying hey we need to access it we need to capture it we need to analyze it and it'll yeah and I mean once we've analyzed it this is kind of where what entity is going to to, to, to perform what decisions and lead into what outcomes right well like any kind like like semantic search um, you need to have that three-layered uh, sandwich. You need to have the customer interface on the outside, which brings the data in. You need to have the uh, interface between you and the customers in the middle. And then on the other side of that is you as a company. And if or any of those layers is not there or is wrong, the sandwich won't work. So again, it's, it's you know, semantics tends to work in this sort of um, uh, tripod yeah. dynamic. I mean, we sort of gone for 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 hours. I, mean, I would sort of big big thanks for this. Uh, You're more than welcome. Ex, ex se through what hope. I mean, hopefully, we sort of teased out a couple of things, right? And let's see if we can sort of summarize. I, I promise to start with data storytelling and narratives. I mean, data we sort of cover that fairly well. Storytelling is. Uh, a larger topic, a uh, more kind of nebulous complex topic, but I mean data and storytelling are at least for a brand and for a business it's kind of the, the accuracy, the agency of the data so it kind of needs to sort of be kind of re reinforcing and evolving spiraling between data and storytelling. I mean for you and me kind of to, 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 to figure out what will happen in the distant future with narratives you and I are pretty certain that ten years from now all those brands that will kind of remain inside siloed institutions, they will be roadkill, right? But I mean, it's it's still a guess, but it's a fairly fairly robust guess given sort of the data that we have. So this is kind of almost roping back from data through storytelling to narrative and back. Right? Uh, we haven't sort of covered technology all that much, and uh, I was kind of hoping that we wouldn't. Uh, what we talked about at length, I think, can actually see that I mean, some of the early winners now who will kind of re reap the increasing returns. They are those companies, brands, that will sort of be cleverest in doing anticipatory design, right? What will customers, given the data they already have, what will they want from us? How can we best serve them one year, two years from now? Uh, it actually, in a bit similar to, I mean, you and I have both visited village squares, right? Where they sell sold us fresh produce. Yes. But the cleverest ones, are those who remember our preferences the, the, the time we, the, the next time we return. Yes, exactly. Yeah. They, because they, there's a personal connection there. And they, yeah. they, they suddenly make you, they bind you into going back again and again. Even though you have ample choices and nobody sees you going elsewhere. You know, it's not like they're going to, you know, there's no sense of betrayal because they won't see you. And yet, you go back because of that connection. So yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, these are the, the lessons that have worked in the past. We forgot a lot of them. In the Industrial Revolution, we lost sight of that. And now we're relearning them, and the stage now, the village square, is global. It's the entire world. So yeah. the challenge is definitely there. I should actually say also to sort of stay true to what I actually said, we were going to talk about kind of the digital spaces thing, kind of one of the lenses. I mean, we, you and I often forget we kind of we have sort of immersed ourselves, right? We are kind of original digital mutants almost, uh, kind of 21st century superpowers, and here we are. But there are to the to the, the big kudos both for Google designers and also for for the Google Plus netizens. There are tons of people. There's Martin Chervinton, there's Thomas Morphy, there's Matt Trapp, Trapp Hagen, Trapp Hagen, there's you, there's Eugene Rosenblatt, there's Leland Collier. Uh, too many to mention, really, who are... I, I, I couldn't sort of describe you other than you are kind of immensely 
generous and helpful. <laughs> so putting a I mean, Ronnie Benson, how to do a hangout, right? I think... Um, yeah, and, and, and lots and lots of these, I mean, Martin Sherwin, how to, 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 to plus your business. Uh, and, and this is kind of almost un unprecedented. I'm kind of still a bit boggled by that, really, because this is kind of where everyone could also have decided that they should have put a narrower uh, kind of uh, constraint on what is the free thing and what is the premium service, right? It's not like that anymore. And I, I, I thought about it at length because, uh, you know, for me, when I first came into this space, it was antithetical to pretty much everything I had learned to work with up to that point. And essentially, it comes down to this. You put as much, in a, rather you get as much in the network as you were willing to put in it. And it's as simple as that. I have gained immensely in terms of knowledge and connectivity and the access of other people's point of view and their brain power. And because I have gained so much, I also put an enormous amount of, of effort into putting stuff back. And the more I put in there, the more it helps other people release fresh value. So I think, you know, suddenly it's, it's a new way of connecting, you know, a conscious way of connecting. You suddenly realize that by acting in this way, you release a lot of pent-up brain power for a lot of people, which then amplify your own. They become part of your connection. So they, you know, it, it comes back to you. The easiest way to describe it is karma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I love that you sort of roped in karma there. I, I was hoping you would. Uh, but I mean, for uh, kind of another way to distill it is to basically say that we are through these digital spaces, through the generosity, I mean, in a very practical sense. Right? I mean, I, I don't pretend that you and me, not in charge, are better people than, than anyone else. It's not that. But there's, well, there's a track record of generosity, right? So this is also important in terms of data. But what what we could see here is that we're actually making good on these two premises that Clay Cherky did, right? Both in terms of cognitive surplus, and also I think one of the titles of his book is "Here Comes Everybody." That's right. Yeah, it's one of his earlier books, and yeah. be before you know, before the, even Facebook took off in a big way. But yeah, it's essentially it it's that kind of um, amplification of the power of the individual through his connectivity. And, and that's what it is. I mean, you know, uh, uh, we use the President of the United, United States as an example. That is a very potent example because within this sphere, any of us commands thousands of people or commands rather the attention and potentially the, the um, ability to listen and act of thousands of people. And that gives tremendous value to the individual. Also, a certain sense of responsibility, and a lot of people are aware of this at an individual level. And it's an entirely new concept in terms of a global community, which, again, this is what it is. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, this is a, I mean, global community, since this is going to be part of this, is going to be packaged into uh, a wider consumption, both on academic community researchers and also entrepreneurs. I mean, I could sort of ask for a better kind of landing point than that, right? Yes. Uh, so, uh, big thanks, David, for this uh, interview, travelogue, expose. Uh, Thank you very much. Through the digital realm. Um, and 